Prime Minister. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How lovely to see you. Very good to be here. Welcome to Chess Match Special. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the weather. I, I suspect you might have had more entertainment sitting through the Brexit reading, mightn't you, rather than this. But uh, <laughs> what a miserable day. Well, it is, a, it is a miserable day, and it's, a, it's unfortunate, obviously, that we've only had very limited cricket here. But look, I mean, we're sitting here looking at this rain, but at least we're not in the, uh, in the Caribbean at the no. moment. When we see the, the terrible devastation of, of uh, that uh, hurricane that's gone through and another one coming through as well. Yeah. And it's interesting, I've, I've just been able to be talking to somebody whose family are out in Antigua and actually sort of hearing firsthand what uh, what it's like and the steps they've had what to take. What are they take. saying? I mean, it really well, is devastating. Well, it is devastating, okay. absolutely devastating. And obviously we've sent uh, one of our uh, Royal Fleet Auxiliary ships, Mounts Bay, was out there, we pre-positioned it. It's moved to the British Virgin Islands today, it was in with, uh, Anguilla, and uh, it'll be sending back more information about what's happening. And as a result of that, I'll be, able, I'll be chairing a, a Government Emergency Committee, our COBRA committee this afternoon, to look to see what extra help we can, we yeah. can give. What and can you do? I mean, you look at the pictures, it's just... Terrible mess. Isn't it? Well, there's, there's the immediate response, and obviously we've had people on the ground. We've had RAF Mounts Bay out there. We've two RAF planes have taken off from Bryce Norton with further supplies and personnel now. Um, we've got uh, you know Royal Marines and Army Engineers on on Mounts Bay. So there's the immediate issue of coping with what is happening to people and, and trying to and supporting people. Mm. Then there's longer term reconstruction that will be necessary. And as we've all seen from the terrible photographs i mean it, it's uh, and the pictures of what's happened is absolutely devastating i think people have uh, just everything for some people has just been destroyed i know another um, one on the way isn't there they say there's, there's another one on the way yeah. um obviously irma is due to hit the turks and caicos as well uh and uh, and jose the next hurricane is on the way these are absolutely devastating in in the impact they've had on the on the islands but yes. also on people's lives yeah. and i'm you know here we are there will be people here supporting the West Indies, people supporting England. I'm sure everybody here um, has at the back of their mind the, the terrible devastation and, and the impact that yeah. the that hurricane has had. And, and once, you know, we want to do everything we can and will do everything we can to support people, but also to help them rebuild. Yeah, that's good to hear. Um, actually, I was watching on the telly last night the last Prime Minister that I interviewed, Gaston Brown from Antigua, who came on, I think the last time we were there, I mean, he was last seen disappearing into the party stand at uh, the old recreation ground in Antigua with his shirt unbuttoned. He's, he's quite, quite a character, so I guess he's got a lot of work on his plate at the moment too. But. Um, they, um, they all have. Um, yeah. Yes, they all have. It's, um, it's, uh, it's always very difficult. I, I think a lot of work was done to prepare people when they knew these hurricanes were coming. Um, and uh, you know, people have been boarding up their windows, getting yep. in supplies and so forth. Um, but this is uh, this is continuing, of course, with the with the next one coming. And as I say, we've got to help with people rebuild their lives. Indeed. Well, welcome to TMS, uh, Prime Minister. You you have. I'm glad to see you have brought an offering. I have indeed. So yes. You, is there a, is Made there a, by my own fair hands. Well, I was going to I ask this. Say, I was yes. going to ask you, you were pottering around the kitchen last night. I, I, I was indeed, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. Well done. To late are your husband's, oh, he's nodding his head. So, so you were there. Well, oh, made by your fair hand. Yes. Um, yes. Can, can you reveal what, what they are? Yes, uh, it, it won't is. It won't be a fanfare, but. It is indeed chocolate brownies. <laughs> chocolate brownies, which I hope will be. Uh, They're very, very nice. Good. To, yes. to a secret recipe of any type or no I, I i don't know as this if, as this is on the bbc i'm not sure if i'm able to reveal who, who which uh, cook actually well, res recipe i use that, that but depends it, um... they, they seem to transfer a bit so you might you might be all right <laughs> <laughs> which... well it's nigel slater's brown re recipe yes excellent yes. Well, yes, yes. And, well we'll look have, forward to those i have tried actually to i have made brownies for tms before um <laughs> once when jeffrey boycott invited me up to headingley right i brought some brownies up uh and handed them to jeffrey but they don't I don't know whether they ever made it into the TMS box. I never saw them. Box. I never saw them. Well, all I will say is that Jeffrey Boycott's still got my Tupperware. Has he? Yes. Well, you've got no chance of seeing that. <laughs> Goodness sake. He won't keep that back again. But it's gl I'm glad you've got the priorities right, that you're potting around in the evening making Brown is a Test Match special rather than, rather than running the country. Much more important, I think. <laughs> now, you obviously are I'm aware... I'm a woman. I can multitask and do the both oh, at the same okay. time. Oh, OK. Well, touche. That's fair enough. Yeah. Now, um, but you're knowledge therefore of test match special but of cricket particularly obviously runs quite deep if you're giving that sort of commitment to, to the program and to the game let's, let's let's start with your cricket first of all and when when did you first become aware of of the great game well it's I, there's no sort of light bulb moment mm. um it was always on my father was a great cricket fan and uh, he was a clergyman so he worked from home quite a lot and so tms used to be on 
in the background. And uh, although we often used to do that thing of, you know, television on, sound down, oh, yes. and listen to, listen to Test Match special uh, commentary. So I can't say that on this date I suddenly realised that, uh, you know, recognised cricket, but it just, I just grew up with cricket around. Yes, yeah. and the voices, presumably. And the voices, indeed, yes. Brian Johnston. Going, and Brian Johnston, well, further back, John Arlott. Yes. You're predating me, really. Just a little bit. <laughs> yes, but, yeah, but it, it, it's, a, it's the way of conveying, conveying the game, I suppose, that captures people, isn't it? It is, and of course, the, the great thing is when you're, uh, as you are at, on Test Match Special, talking through the whole of the, uh, of the match, everything that's happening. For, uh, OK, as I say, you know, people, some people have in the past been able to have the television on and then mm. and listen to it, but for a lot of people, what they see, what they see of the game, is what they hear of the game from from you. But it's not just the game, is it? It's everything around it as well. Characters it's the involved. Though. Characters. It's the atmosphere. Yes. Did you ever try, did you ever try and play? No, I've never played. Not even in the garden with your dad. Well, uh, in a little bit of what we used to call French cricket, I, oh, I yes. had a little bat and he sort of <laughs> threw a ball at me and I <laughs> tried yes. to hit it. But not any. But not serious cricket. Okay. No. But you obviously got involved in the game because I, I, I was reading about your connection with Benazir Bhutto, for instance, which is an amazing story if you're going to back it up. I mean, I, I do trust yes. most of my sources on this. But Benazir Bhutto, former Prime Minister of Pakistan, introduced you to your husband. Indeed, yes. Based on your mutual love of cricket. And I'm talking about yours and Benazir Bhutto's mutual love of cricket, not merely your husband's. Is well, right? it is certainly correct that Benazir introduced me to uh, to my the, Philip, who is then to become my husband. Yes. Um, I think it would be probably more accurate to say that, that it came from a, a mutual love of politics, because oh, right. it was in a, a sort of uh, at uh, what was essentially a, a, a political event that she uh, that she introduced us uh, right. that were both, when we were both up at Oxford University. But she obviously knew that your love of cricket was was mutual then. Uh, well, I think so. Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. She was. It must be an extraordinary woman. I mean, it, and when she assassinated like that, it, it must have. It, it was a, you very hard. Well, it was a huge shock. Yes. yes. I mean, and and um, it was at the time. I, I remember because Philip and I we just literally just turned on the television um, when it had happened and, and suddenly saw the news and. It is devastating when somebody who you've been at university with, you've seen, you know, there were ups and downs in her political career, obviously, but had been Prime Minister of Pakistan, um, and, and just just like that, is yes. no longer with us, no longer, no longer able to do what she wanted to do. Yeah. Is it a reminder of, of, of how dangerous politics can be? Uh, particularly perhaps if you're a woman, I don't know, but does that make it even more difficult, more resonant? Perhaps? Well, I think what's important in politics is that you don't think of those aspects of it you think simply of what you want to do what you want to achieve how you want to help people um but it is it can be quite difficult for for women um you know i've quite a few of my uh, female colleagues have told stories in in the recent election campaign of some of the harassment they were getting yes. particularly on social media um and obviously there have been some uh, profile cases. Um, one Labour MP who who actually the person harassing her on social media was uh, they was prosecuted and the police looked into that. So that sort of um, atmosphere of people feeling they can do that, particularly to women politicians, is very difficult. Yes, that's on my list. I want to move on to that. But I'm dealing with cricket first of all, uh, uh, Prime Minister Tony Gray. Now that's the name that I thought linked Benazir Bhutto and you. This very tall, handsome Trinidad fast bowler. And, and that was something that ran through this introduction with the cricket. Is that is that false information somewhere? I'm afraid. He's not the, so, the Surrey fast yes. bowler. There the, 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 the wasn't an obvious. Philip scratching his back of his head there. <laughs> Tony Gray. No, no, Tony Gregg maybe. Is well, I was going to say Tony Gregg. Oh, I maybe they, maybe they misspelled um, it. Was, was Tony Gregg a bit of an icon? Uh, Tony Gregg was yes, yes. Okay. When he was yes. And Jeffrey Boycott was certainly yes. I mentioned that name with some trepidation. What was your admiration? I wasn't going to say attraction. Admiration for for Jeffrey Boycott. Um, the fact that he just stuck in there and got on with the job. I think that was the right. uh, that was a great thing. Didn't he bore and... you tears <laughs> while you were watching all this? No, but the whole point was he stuck at it. Right. And he very carefully had a plan and he just got on with it and. Uh, more often than not, delivered. Yeah. Did you ever go and see him? Did you ever see him play? Or was this purely conveyed by radio I've, TV? I've only ever seen him play in on television and uh, heard it on the radio. I've never actually seen him uh, right. play live. No. 
But if you're giving him some brownies, you must be um, you must be have some affection for him somehow. Well, as I say, the brownies were intended for the TMS team. Yes. It was Geoffrey who took them. So. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, any other memories of, of cricket? Then I mean, where you were? I mean, how, how do you, can you still follow it now? I mean, here you are here today, after all, and you've picked a bad one to come. But um, can you still keep up to date with? It's much harder. It's much harder. Although I, I have to confess that um, when I was on the plane out to Japan, we did get the result of the uh, second test sent through to oh, us. Oh, did you? Um, that wouldn't have cheered you up too much. Well, but, but that was, I thought, that actually showed one of the great attractions of cricket, which is that, you know, through that whole get, it was going one way and then the other. Mm. And, you know, it was that fascination. For it, but I don't. I'm not able to see much these days. I'm afraid, no. uh, and uh, there's not a lot of time to keep up with it. Yeah, but you had the women's team, I think, to attend Downing Street, didn't you? I recently? did indeed. Yeah, yes, because I mean, that, that, that was fantastic, yes. fantastic victory that they had. Yes, absolutely wonderful. Did they behave themselves? It wasn't. They didn't repeat the men's um, when they won the Ashes in 2005. I hope in Tony Blair's garden. Um, no, well, I wasn't in Tony Blair's garden in 2005, but I was in Trafalgar Square in 2005. Were you really? watching watching the uh, watching the uh, England team? The Were you? Oh, it was an amazing day. It was an absolutely incredible day. It was also the first time I'd ever physically seen the ashes. Oh. Um, and uh, I, because I'd imagine this great big yes. urn. It was, and it's tiny. Yes, they are. They are. So you were there just as a, just as a, as a fan? or Just, felt just as a fan, there. but also at the time I was um, shadowing the uh, culture, media and sports department. So right. a number of people with uh, sort of relevant um, uh, policy areas were uh, also invited. Yes. But uh, as somebody who enjoys cricket, I was delighted to be able to... I, mean, I, I, I was there that day, and I think if you were there, you really felt gripped by it. And yet some people sort of down the line have thought, oh, we shouldn't, it was over the top, we shouldn't have done it, and so on. But there's nothing wrong with some patriotism, is there? I mean, that was no, basically exactly. what it was. it was. It was a great result, and it was great to say to the team, well done. Yes. And they team certainly enjoyed themselves. Yeah, but they did. Um, you're starting a new season already, aren't you now? Um, how, how have you gone about your, your off-season? Because it must have been a, a pretty low point at the end of the election and so on. How, how have you gone away and, and, and sort of pulled yourself back together again? I mean, we sort of had sporting things to this, but I mean, sports would lose confidence or whatever, and you've still got to stand up there and in the Commons and be in charge and and, and, and present yourself in, in a confident sort of a way. How, how, how have you gone about turning over what's happened over the last couple of months? Well, of course, the thing about politics is that there's, in a sense, that you're straight into it. After an election, you are straight into it. But what, um, what drove me at the time immediately after the election was the importance of the country having a government that could deliver. And what continues to drive me is actually delivering, because I think we've got a real job to do. And yes, there's Brexit. But actually, there's more than that. It's about a country that works, genuinely does work for everyone. And it's about making the most of our opportunities for the future. Hmm. And it's have a feeling that there's still that job to be done that is so important. Did, did you take it very personally, uh, the, the election result? Did you feel it, it was a personal statement from people or not? Did you, did you, did it hurt? You, well, you, you have to, um, I mean, it is, it is difficult to go into an election thinking, hoping, um, working for a particular result and then getting a different result. And as the leader of the party, um, of course you have to, you have to look personally, take it to, to a degree personally, and you have to accept that responsibility. Mm. Do, 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 are you frustrated by it? I mean, did, did you feel that people saw the real you in the course of that campaign or, or not? I mean, is that something you look back on and think, oh, I didn't get that right? You're, you're always going to look back, and, well, any election campaign, particularly one that has gone like that, you have to look back and say, what, uh, what should we have done? What did we do that we shouldn't have done? What did we not do? Um, I, throughout my political career, I've always enjoyed, cam this was a campaign like no other that I've ever had, because I've always enjoyed actually getting out there and knocking on doors and meeting people in the streets. And of right. course, as party leader and as prime minister, you uh, tend to have a slightly different sort of campaign. In, in what way though? Well, it's more, se it's more um, meeting groups of people and, uh, you know, Obviously, making a number of speeches, things like that. Yeah, but did you feel that you were that you were yourself? I mean, people I've spoken to, and I've, I've obviously speak to people I know, journalists and so on. And so, oh, but Theresa May coming, you know, what's she going to be like? Oh, she's you know, get her away from the microphone. She's great fun, you know, a real good giggle, good sense of humour, and so on. We never really saw that though. Then, and uh, does, that, does that frustrate you? Um, I think it's it it's. Uh 
look, in any in any election campaign, you make a, a plan is made about what that campaign is going to be like. Um, I think I get frustrated. People use the term robotic about me yes, during that campaign. That must hurt. <laughs> I don't think I'm in the least robotic. As I say, what I really enjoy is getting out there, talking to people, hearing from them, understanding what the issues are for them. Yes. That's what drove me when I, you know, when I first became Prime Minister and stood outside Downing, 10 Downing Street. I talked about a country that works for everyone. I talked about those people who do find life And difficult. that resonated, actually, didn't and it? That yes, speech? And, yes, and that is what still drives me as Prime Minister. Yes. So therefore, when you're repeating a phrase and, and people are calling you robotic, that must be, you, you must think, oh, it's, why? Because there's something behind it. This is the important thing. Um, you know, it, it is genuinely, I do feel that there are people around parts of the country who feel that, you know, perhaps decisions that politicians make, you know, leave them behind, don't really help them, don't support them in the way that's necessary. And I want to ensure that we do, as a government, provide that support, that help for people. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and there's a whole variety of ways in which we can do that. But some of the issues that I'm um, taking on board are things that have been left to one side for too long, not given the attention that, you know, mental health, particularly among young people, hugely important issue for us. We really need to make sure that we're dealing with that. Yes. And ca can you make the ground back? This is the question, really. I mean, I'm back on that confidence thing again, I, I suppose. You know, how, how are you going to show that you're, you, you are back in charge and that there is a side to you that perhaps you didn't see then? And I mean, or, or, or you're not going to, you know, does it not bother you necessarily? Or do you have to just simply be firm and strident and in charge and, 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 that's, and that's it? I think the important thing for, for people is to see that the government is doing its job uh, and, and is delivering for them. And I think from the, the message I get from most people around, from members of the public, is they just want that. They want to know that the government... They know the government's got a big job to do. They just want us to get on with it. Yeah. What, would, what do you wish you'd known about being Prime Minister before you got the job? Is there any one thing that has taken you by surprise? Um, gosh, it's... Well, of course, having been Home Secretary for six years, I'd worked with David Cameron, so I'd seen the job at fairly close quarters. So you see quite a lot of it. I think that there's, there are some um, aspects of it that you don't see, that... that um, are really, you know, and, and these are really positive aspects of it. I mean, for example, um, I sign and I presented one um, only uh, uh, earlier this week to a, a volunteer who raises funds for crisis, the homelessness charity. Right. We, we um, provide ev uh, every day of the year, a volunteer somewhere in the country will be identified as a point of light and given a certificate to recognize the difference they're making in their community. Now, I didn't know that happened, no. but it does. And uh, it's uh, great to be able to recognise people out there doing fantastic things who so often are never heard about. Yeah. It is nice that you can still actually spend time to make some brownies, though, uh, in the evening. I'm just going to tell people it's, it's lunch here um, and uh, it's raining at the moment. And the Prime Minister, Theresa May, is here. We're chatting away through the lunch break. You've got another 15 minutes or so, I hope, before you scurry off. Well, it's Cobra, isn't it? It's so Cobra, it is. yes. That's much more important. Um, let me ask you, Prime Minister, um, how do you avoid, or perhaps not avoid, perhaps you encourage, but I suspect possibly avoid, comparisons, inevitable comparisons with, with Mrs Thatcher? I mean, did, did you ever meet her and, and what, what were your thoughts of, of, of her? I, I only ever met her very, very briefly. I met her very briefly a couple of times. So, unlike, I mean, obviously I've had some colleagues in the Commons who've known her very well, some who've worked with her, John Whittingdale, so, um, PPS, for example. Um, so, but I only ever met her very, very briefly on a couple of occasions. Right. And I try to, I mean, some people, inevitably, second female Prime Minister, some people Bound will to try be. to sort of talk about this. Of course. But th there was only ever one Margaret Thatcher. You know, I'm Theresa May, I do things in my way and, 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 uh, and the circumstances of the, uh, of the government are different. Yes. It's interesting because I mean, your, your voices sometimes when you're at the dispatch box sound quite similar, don't they? And a bit of finger waving and so on coming in that it sort of reminds us of a certain age of, of, of Mrs Thatcher, I suppose. <laughs> but well, there's absolutely I was no say, intention. There's, there's, um, there's quite often a lot of finger waving yes, in the there Commons. Is. <laughs> there uh, is. I, I, I love that theatre though. Do you, do you enjoy it? Do you, do you like getting in there and, and getting rolling your sleeves up and, and uh, taking on PMQs? Yes, I mean the, the, the point is everybody in the House of Commons has been elected and been elected to do a job and of course there are some 
passionately held views mm. on different sides of, of the argument on different on different issues. And you get that sense, I think, in PMQs. I think my one the one thing I would say is that obviously an awful lot of other work goes on in the House of Commons that often people don't see. Often people will see PMQs. They won't see the very serious debates, long, lo lengthy debates that take place on, on issues sure. of the day. Is, is, is answer evasion the number one on the list? No, answering in... Uh, I always remember, I, I think I will, if I may quote John Major, another yes, great fine. cricket Absolutely. fan. And I always remember John Major saying to uh, a group when he was talking to them once, he said, you can ask me any question you like, as long as you don't mind me answering it the way I like. Right. But it frustrates people, though, doesn't it? You, oh, why don't you answer the living questions? But you do, I mean, very often, actually, you are answering the question, but you may not be giving the answer that the interviewer wants to hear. Right. And there's a difference between that. Okay. That's not answer evasion. That's just giving a different answer from the one the interviewer wants. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's fair. But I, I sit there and, and I and I, I don't know. I I, I love the, the sort of the theatre of, of of people getting very head up and so on. But I get a bit frustrated when the when the, it's, it's the Jeffrey boycott defence. The forward defensive block comes out, isn't it? That's the thing. You don't get oh. the, uh, it suited Jeffrey well. <laughs> well, now let's move on because uh, Jeffrey. I, I work with this individual you don't have to know who's he's unpredictable um, he's awkward he's outspoken um, he takes to Twitter um, but I can reach across you see like I can with you and I can cut his microphone off now you can't do that with Donald Trump um, how, how do you how do you work with how do you aim to work with him well you you work uh, with Donald Trump as any prime minister would work with any American president, which is, it's about building relationship, but the, the point is that the United Kingdom and the United States have a special relationship. It's been there for, you know, for years, for decades, with a whole variety of prime ministers and presidents. Uh, and, but it's important that, it, that we have that relationship because it's important for our safety and security yes. uh, and for the, the role that we're both able to play. But is this that regardless of who he is? I mean, can, can you just have to accept what what there is there and try and work with it. Well, you work with, and I've had some good, um, you know, obviously I went to the United States uh, and visited and had meetings with President Trump very shortly after he'd been inaugurated as, as president. Um, and we had some good positive, uh, positive discussions there. For example, um, when I was there, he committed 100% to NATO. That's a very important for the defence of Europe, for our defence and security, um, that he did that. Although previously in his campaign, he'd made some um, less positive remarks about NATO, yes. but I was able to talk to him and he committed 100% to it. Yes. So it's about build, having those discussions, talking through the issues. Yes. The holding hands bit. Who, who held whose hand first? It was, um, I'll, well, I'm very... You didn't hold, did you clutch his hand no, first? No, I'm very happy to tell, tell the story because we were walking along. He said there was a ramp around the corner right. and uh, it might be difficult walking down it, so to take his arm. And then when we got to the top of the ramp, he took my hand just, just for going down the ramp and then that was it. So, so quite I think the gentleman, was, actually. I think it was to assist, yes. Was it? Were you thinking at the time, oh, oh dear, in terms of sort of photographs and... No, I didn't realise... Well, I mean, I suddenly you suddenly see this bank of photographers and yes. then, of course, it becomes something that the photographers and the journalists and the commentators and everybody picks up. Yes. But I think it was genuinely a moment of, uh, of uh, assistance. Oh, well, that's nice to hear. Do you think the world's a safer place with him around? I think... Well, I think there are quite a few challenges in the world at the moment. Um, the role that America plays in keeping the world safe is very important. Yes. Um, but obviously with issues like the activities in North Korea uh, at the moment. Is that number one on is... the list? I mean, I know with Brexit and all that sort of stuff, but do you think North Korea is, is number one on the list at the moment? Well, the, the, the great thing about the job I do is that you can't just put your focus on one thing at any one time. You have to be aware of all the issues that you're dealing with. But certainly, I've just come back from a trip to Japan, obviously, I, and I went there literally just, just sort of hours or a day after, um, the, uh, the North Koreans had tested an, uh, a, a missile, mm. not the nuclear test, but had tested a, a missile across Japanese territory. So a real, obviously, as you can imagine, a real concern there about that. Talking to Prime Minister Abe about how we, the United Kingdom, can work with Japan and the wider international community to put pressure on North Korea through sanctions, uh, uh, 
to uh, to change their behaviour. Yeah. But do you think it'll work? I mean, can, can you, do you wake up in the mornings like a lot of us do and open the paper, uh, go on the internet and think, oh, you know, is, have they let another one off or, or something? I mean, is it is it that pressing? Do you think? That I think that there is. It's important for the international community to work, to work together at this time, and to be uh, to be pressing North Korea, to be pressing China as well. Um, obviously, um, as uh, the country that perhaps has um, most leverage in in terms of North Korea. Yeah. Do you trust Donald Trump though to to not press the button or or, or be reckless? Yeah. I believe that the Ameri that Donald Trump as American president will take the decisions that are right for security and safety around the world. He has very good advisors around him um, in uh, some of the uh, individuals that he has in key roles of state, uh, defence and so forth. Um, and we will work with them. Yeah, I mean, that's why, I mean, he will consult you, you think. He's not going to go off and do something by himself. We will work with him. I was talking to him earlier this week. I had a call with him earlier this week, talking exactly about North Korea, uh, talking about what we can do together, at, particularly at the United Nations. There's key discussions at the Security Council of the United Nations and how we can work with others around the world to right. other countries to uh, to uh, achieve what we all want, which is for North Korea to stop what are illegal what is it? Ill illegal activity. Yes. I've got 10 minutes with you. Could you talk about, you, you touched on social media, I think. It is something that we all get affected by. It doesn't matter what job you do. Um, there's a very positive side of social media and you were very kind to ask up my wife earlier and, and sort of the, 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 the massive support that she's had because we kind of took a decision to put it out there. We think we had to. And it's incredible when social media works positively. It's very warm and, it, and, it, and it's, it, it's very supportive. However, there is, as we all know, this very dark side to it. It's very easy for people to be deeply unpleasant to other individuals these days, and clearly in politics you've, you've had that. Do you, do you worry about where we're going? There is a situation where people really can un unleash such venom. And I suppose in your case, I mean, would you, would, would you worry about a, a woman like you sort of going into politics now and the, sort of the, the hostility that there is out there? Well, I think it's, you're, you're absolutely right. Of course, social media is hugely positive yes. in most of the ways that, that, that people will use it. Um, but there is this aspect to it that does enable people to harass others, to, to make really very unpleasant comments and beyond unpleasant comments. Yes. Real and threats. That's and, uh, real threats. And yes. that's why it's important. And the Crown Prosecution Service recently issued some new guidance on prosecutions of online harassment and, and uh, uh, threats online and so forth. And I think it's important that action is taken um, when it's right, when it's, when it's past the, the level that is appropriate in terms of criminality and prosecutions. The other aspect of social media, though, that does worry me, and I did touch on it earlier, is the impact that it has on the mental health of young people. Yes. Young people who find themselves being harassed on uh, social media and often find it very difficult to... Um, to disassociate themselves from, you know, because they, everybody uses social media. And, you know, if you stop using it, then you become unusual. Yes. So people carry on using it, but often find that this is, is having an impact on them. And we're doing more to try and um, to train staff in schools to be aware of mental health problems, to be able to recognise them and know how to deal with those. And I went to a, uh, a school in Bristol some weeks ago and just sat down with a small group of, of students there who it was a secondary school who had suffered from mental health problems, who were being terribly brave in speaking about this, raising awareness of it. But social media was one of the issues yes. that they raised that, I mean, it, that it made is, life difficult for it, them. It is education, really, isn't it? It's about teaching kids that this is not the way to behave. It's, it's just like being naughty in a playground. It's being the same as being unpleasant on a computer, isn't it? Well, I think that's one of the... You've hit on one of the, uh, one of the approaches that we need to take, and I think this is important to take in relation to criminal activity as well, which is to say if it's, if it's a crime offline, it's a crime online. Yes. I think sometimes people think that online is a different sort of world and that it doesn't matter, and you can do whatever you like. Actually, no, you can't. You should behave online as you would offline. Yes, yeah. But it, I mean, it, it does concern you. I mean, it, it, it's, it's a growing phenomenon, a growing concern, the way that people behave on there. Well, it is because of some of the incidents that we've seen of the genuine problems that it, it can cause. As I say, the mental health aspect that it has. Of course, there are wider issues of the use of the internet that yes. we look at as government. The, and particularly when we're looking at the issue around extremism, um, dealing with terrorists, uh, for example, the importance of working with companies so that 
material that can that can incite people basically to go out and commit a terrorist attack is not uh, is not available. We need to do more work with the companies on that. Okay. I suppose one or two of the last thoughts. Oh, actually, I was just saying here at the Somerset Cricket, uh, Peter Trigo is talking about the abuse that, that he's been getting. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not just politicians, is it? I mean, he, he said here to send professional athletes who are giving their best abusive messages is an absolute disgrace. And unfortunately, I think it's, it's a little bit en vogue at the moment for young people to feel that it's okay to do that. Mm. That kind of re reflects what we're saying, doesn't it? Yes, it, it, it's. I think this is this is it. You've got people who will be just getting on, doing their job, and. Uh, other people feel that it doesn't matter. It's almost as if the, they they forget that there's a person yes. on the receiving end of it. Because they're not really there, are they? Because they're You're not. Just it, because it's just firing or... it into this ether. Um, you have to remember there's somebody at the other end of it. Yeah, they're clearing up here, which is good news. Um, what, what time are you rushing off, Prime Minister? I'm you... afraid I have to go straight back uh, now to Downing Street to uh, obviously. Um, hear about the latest information from the Caribbean, but then chair the Cobra. Right, OK. So have you seen any play at all? I've seen a, about half an hour's play, oh. yes. Oh, yes, that's but awful. there we are. I must ask, because there's been speculation, obviously, about, about your future and so on, and, and, and um, you're saying I'm not a quitter. Did you feel that you had to say that? I mean, you couldn't really say I'm a quitter, could you? I mean, was that something that just you were in one of those situations where you, you just had to say it? But I'm not a quitter. I mean, I think it's, it wasn't just a, a question. It's, it's um, I think, uh, hopefully a reflection of somebody who feels that there is a job to be done uh, and that we should, I and the government, mm. are getting on and doing it. And I think that's what the public are looking to us to do as the government, just deliver for them. What's it like at work, um, wandering through the corridors there at, at, uh, at the Commons? I mean, are you wondering what people are saying? Are you, are you aware of, sort of your own party? I don't know, building up any sort of resistance or anything like that? Do you feel a bit like, you know, watch your back? <laughs> Look, I'm, my, all through my political career, I've taken the view that actually, whatever job you're in, what you should do is go, get on, give of your best, do the best job you can. I have a hugely privileged position in being Prime Minister, um, but there are some huge challenges for the country. Mm. And my job is to make sure that we actually address those, that we deal with them properly, that we get the answers right, and that we deliver for people. And we, and, you know, I'm in politics because I want to make a difference to people's lives. I want to improve people's lives. That's what drives me. Yeah. Do you enjoy it? You, every morning, you get up with a bound and here we go, we're off to go and uh, do, you know, save the world or something. I mean, do you, do you really get energised by that every day? You, you, I do enjoy it um, because it's, and, and you're energised by the fact that it's so important and by the fact that I genuinely do want to deliver a country that works for everyone. I've got a question here from my producer. We've got a Cricket World Cup in England just after Brexit in 2019. Will it be an opportunity to show that Britain is open for business? And it is. It's a big, a big summer. A, it, it will be a big summer. And uh, there you are, a great event that will indeed show that we're open for business. And uh, we, we're forging new friendships around the world, working with new partners around the world, building, enhancing our, um, some of our long-standing links, like my trip to Japan. But there we are. That will be showcasing Britain for the world. OK, excellent. Promise was lovely to have met you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for the brownies. They'll be tested officially a little bit later <laughs> on. But, uh, but uh, good luck this afternoon. I hope you come up with some good decisions for, for all those in the, in, the, in the Caribbean. Thank you. Yes, some important decisions to take. Lovely to have met you.